Hello, and thank you for joining us for the fifth session of the University of Western States Chiropractic Workshop Week. My name is Stephen Glass, and I'm an admissions advisor for the Doctor of Chiropractic program. In today's session, you will hear from Dr. William Borman, Professor of Basic Sciences at UWS. Dr. Borman has been with the University of Western States since 1994 and has been instrumental in establishing UWS as a leader in evidence-informed chiropractic education. Dr. Borman, Dr. Borman will present about the anatomy lecture and lab courses, human cadaver prosection, and what students should expect in the UWS gross anatomy classroom environment. Questions are welcomed and can be posted in the Q&A box to be answered after the presentation. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. William Borman. Well, hello everybody. I am very happy to be here to uh, speak to you about something that's very close to my heart, uh, which is teaching anatomy, uh, particularly here at University of Western States. And so uh, I thought I'd begin by telling you just a little bit about myself. As Stephen said, I, I started here at uh, UWS in 1994. As you see there in my title, my background is as a PhD. So I am not a DC, I'm not a chiropractor. I'm a PhD trained anatomist. My background is in anatomy and cell biology. I uh, graduated from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, I realized that I started here probably, maybe possibly before some of you were born. So let's suffice it to say that I'm, I'm an experienced uh, anatomist. I was department chair uh, for our Department of Basic Sciences for about eight years, beginning in 2005. Our Department of Basic Sciences covers all the foundational sciences, so that includes anatomy, which we'll talk about today. But in addition, um, we teach courses in biochemistry and uh, physiology, microbiology, uh, neuroscience, and pathology. So uh, my colleagues and I have um, put together the curriculum to cover that entire spectrum of foundational content. Uh, in 2013, I became the dean of the entire college. And so uh, I have some perspective from a program uh, level perspective. I did that for about five years. Um, being a dean is a, a particular kind of job that has its uh, benefits or pros and cons. Um, I did that for five years and was very happy to return to the faculty in 2018. I returned back to the basic sciences department at that time. And that's really where I enjoy my work the most. So what I find the most rewarding is to work with students um, as part of your process in becoming a, a doctor of chiropractic. And I find that to be the most rewarding. And, and of that type of work, the thing that I enjoy the most is being in the anatomy lab and working with you as, as we're working with our donors, our cadavers. And so that's uh, something that we'll talk about a bit more here through the afternoon. I have taught courses across the spectrum of anatomical sciences. So the, the biggie is, is gross anatomy, where we look at um, macroscopic structure. That's where we work with our donors and, and look at the anatomy in the, in the dissected um, cadavers. But I've also taught courses in something called histology. That's essentially microscopic anatomy. So that's looking at the same kind of anatomical structures, but looking at them from a different perspective, a closer in perspective. I've also taught courses, a course in human development. You might know that to be embryology. And so the idea there is uh, when, we, when we learn anatomy, it's also beneficial to learn how things develop in the way that they, they ultimately become. And so that's a, that's a pretty interesting uh, topic to talk about how we move from a, a single celled structure all the way up to the uh, adult form that we end up forming into. And I've also taught courses in cell biology. Um, the one anatomical science that I haven't taught um, and I'm probably a little rusty in at this point is in the neuroanatomy, neuroscience. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a, an excellent neuroscience faculty member in our, in our uh, department. She's Dr. Major and um, she handles that aspect of anatomical sciences. So 
the main topic really that I'm going to be speaking to today has to do with how we how we do essentially gross anatomy. And it turns out that we are literally right at a transition point where we are moving from a fairly conventional approach to teaching gross anatomy to something where we're going to do a bit more of an integrated approach. And so Literally, we got the uh, approval to make this curricular change. It just came through this week. And so I wasn't quite sure if we'd have formal approval before I started speaking to you or not. So I want to just tell you a little bit about where we were and where we're going to. So with regard to gross anatomy, it's a three course sequence. And so you take a gross anatomy course in each of the first three terms of the program. The three courses are numbered one, two, and three. They're not really required to be taken sequentially. What they do is they cover the anatomy regionally in three different parts of the body. So you see that uh, the course we call Gross Anatomy One, which you take in the first quarter of the program, that's what I mean by Q1 here, uh, that covers the first unit of that course covers the back which makes some sense for uh, future chiropractic students. And then the second unit covers the upper limbs or the upper extremities. And the third portion of that course covers the lower extremities. The numbers that you see here refer to the credit allocations for the lecture and lab parts of those courses. So it's got uh, four hours of lecture per week and there's, a th there's three hours of lab time per week. And we'll get into the details of that a little bit more momentarily. That course is coordinated with a short course that specifically covers the anatomy of the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. And so that course is called spinal anatomy. In the second term of the program, we move into a course uh, where we cover specifically the head and neck. And then that's followed in the third term of the program where we do essentially the torso. So we do a unit on the thorax, we do one on the abdomen, and then we finish out with the pelvis and the, and the perineum, which is the area where the external genitalia are. So in our traditional curriculum, we would have those gross anatomy courses. And then in parallel, uh, you take a separate course in histology, you take a separate course in human development. Um, the histology class is in the second term, the human development class is in the third term. There's a cell biology course in the, in the first term. So those courses are taught in parallel, but at different times. What we're doing going forward, effective in fall of this term, so many of you are contemplating beginning the program in fall, is we are transitioning to a very integrated approach to that same content. I'm actually really excited about it because I think it will help to tie things together very much uh, more so for students. So we're moving to a course series that's similar in, in concept, but has different content. Uh, we're calling it the human morphology course series rather than a specific gross anatomy course series. The basic topics remain the same sequentially. So in human morphology one, which is the course that you take in the first quarter, it still covers the back and extremities. Second quarter still covers head and neck. Third quarter still covers thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. The big difference though, is that now I'm going to be integrating the histology, the microscopic anatomy and the development topics right along the way. So as we go through and we first look at the adult anatomy in our cadavers and we talk about it, you learn the relationships at an adult level. We'll do that macroscopically. We'll talk about it from a gross anatomical perspective. And then we'll transition seamlessly into kind of a microscopic perspective. So for example, when we're talking about the anatomy of the vertebral column or anatomy of bones, for example, we'll get into the microscopic architecture of bones at the very same time. And then we'll follow that up with processes that are involved in bone development, because bones in different parts of the body develop by different mechanisms. And so the beauty of this approach, I think, is that we're going to tie these topics together so that instead of learning gross anatomy at one point, and then maybe a term later, looking at the histology of that same topic, and then maybe a term later, looking at the development of that same topic, we can wrap these conversations all up into the same moment in time. I think it's going to really help students um, 
package this information together and reach a, a deeper level of understanding. And so I'm in the process of, of developing those courses as we speak, and we're going to roll it out to begin with in fall of 22 is when we'll first start with the, the morphology course series. So each of these courses has a lecture aspect to it, and it also has, they also have a lab component to it. So I thought I'd break it out to talk about the, the details on both sides of the courses. The lecture component of these courses is a very detailed, very comprehensive, very thorough uh, discussion of anatomy, histology, and, and development at really the highest levels. This is comparable to what would be appropriate to any health care professional program. So we're in a chiropractic program, but this is as detailed or in some cases, uh, maybe even more detailed than what um, anatomy would be like in an osteopathic program or a medical school program or a PA program. Um, in certain respects, particularly with regard to musculoskeletal anatomy and the, the innervation, the neurovascular supply, I would say we are in some respects probably even more detailed, more thorough than, than what um, is conventional in medical school program. I, as a student, went through a medical school um, gross anatomy course series, and so I have some, some experience of what that, what that was like. We do a very thorough, very comprehensive um, coverage of all this foundational content. And then throughout, it's all contextualized with clinical applications. So wherever and whenever possible, we try to show you how um, these various uh, topics have clinical applicability. But again, we're at a foundational level. We're trying to set the stage, set the groundwork, so that when you progress through the program and you get to the point where you start moving into the clinical experience, that's really where the emphasis transitions more heavily onto clinical application. And the expectation is that um, you will come to that point in the program with a solid foundation that you derive from, from working with us in the, in the first year. So it's, with regard to the first course, be it gross anatomy one or human morphology one, the, the sequence of things will be fairly similar. Um, you see that I've, I've pulled out some of the, the learning outcomes for these courses. It's common that as we start a unit, uh, we first go through the osteology. That's the study of the bony anatomy for a particular region. So I've just, I've just started here at the very beginning of the first course where we're talking about the anatomy of the vertebral column. So of course, we'll go through and uh, we'll learn all of the different landmarks on, on the various bones. Um, but more than that, we learn about what their functional relationships are. And so it's more than just learning about the name of a facet or the name of a a transverse process or a, a tubercle, but it's important to realize why those structures are there. And that has to do oftentimes with which muscles have attached there or which neurovascular structures are passing uh, across those landmarks or what have you. So we try to provide context to all of the detail that, that we, we discuss. And we do this in all the different regions of the body. Typically, we start with the osteology. Generally, we follow that with a discussion about the ligamentous structure associated with those very same bones. And so you'll learn not just the names and locations of the ligaments, but again, you'll learn how they relate to the underlying bones, their attachment points. And probably most importantly, you learn about the functional, um, the functional effects or the functional attributes of those ligaments. And what I mean by that is you learn about what, uh, what positions the ligaments uh, support, what movements they, they facilitate and or what movements they limit. And, um, and then in instances where there's injury, you learn about what happens when a ligament is, is injured and, and this to, to some degree, even what happens as it, as it repairs itself. In gross anatomy or human morphology one, it, the major topic there has to do with the, the musculoskeletal system. So we spend a lot of time going through the anatomy of the muscular system. Um, you can uh, anticipate that in the back and in the extremities, there's a, a very significant number of muscles that we look at. And we take you through each of those, looking very specifically at the attachment points, the origins and insertions, and thinking about the functional attributes of those muscles. What kinds of actions do they contribute to? 
And then we associate that with the neurovascular supply. So we look at innervation patterns throughout the whole body. We look at the vascular supply and all of this then gets contextualized by clinical application. And the general way that that happens, particularly in this course, is we, we talk about what happens in the circumstance where there's injury. And so what would happen if a particular nerve got compressed or injured? What would be the subsequent effects that would occur out in the body? And um, we talk about uh, sensory loss in different areas or, or muscle function deficits in different areas, whatever the, the case may be. So suffice it to say that we expect a lot. We give you the opportunity to learn all there is to learn about anatomy. So how do we support that? I'm actually really proud of the resources that, that I've put together to try to facilitate your ability to learn this content. I've tried to create resources in these anatomy courses that uh, facilitate multiple different approaches to learning. So one of the things that, that I've done over the years is I've created a very detailed note packet for each of the, the three classes. And I'm in the process of, of uh, revising these to support the transition into the human morphology course experience. So these detailed note packets are effectively like I have taken notes for you already. These just happen to be pictures of the, a couple of pages at the beginning of the, the gross one packet. So it's just an area where we're getting to, into the muscles of the back. Um, over on the right hand side, you can see trapezius and various details about it. Latissimus dorsi, those are two superficial muscles in the back. Um, there's some general comments. And then I go through the origin, insertion, action, and innervation and vascular supply for each of those. So in your undergraduate experience, I'm sure you're very familiar with the need to take notes. The reality here is there's way too much content, I think, for you to try to take notes in real time as, as you're going through the lecture experience. So to try to facilitate that, I've pre-provided you with a note packet that already gets you well along the way in having notes available. And to complement that note packet, I've got PowerPoint slides the PowerPoint slides are not just duplicates of the note packet, they're complementary to it. So the PowerPoint slides are filled with images that come from a database that we use extensively. And my style is very much a Q&A based style. So I'll have a lot of prompts on the PowerPoint slides that will prompt me to talk about the anatomy. And what students typically do is they will follow along with these PowerPoint slides while they're reading through this note packet and spending less time trying to write a whole bunch of information down and instead taking some time to think about what's being described and try to visualize the anatomy that, that you're experiencing. Um, in our program, these courses are hybrid taught courses, which means I pre-record a lot of the lecture material. You have the latitude to go through that on your own time. That's called asynchronous um, course material. And then for each of the lectures, in addition to the conventional lectures, I also provide what I call a Q&A review video. And so what that is, is after I've gone through the lecture material, where I've done it, I've spoken affirmatively, and I've answered all of these questions or described to you the, the various anatomical relationships, then I will follow with what turns out to be a very uh, Q&A based review. I will use images such as what I'm showing you, where there are just unlabeled pictures. And I will, my MO is I'll point to something, say, what is this muscle? I'll hesitate and say it's trapezius. Where does it originate? It originates off the superior nuchal line or the nuchal ligament or the spinous processes of the, of the thoracic vertebra. And so it's, it's as if I am functioning as your virtual study buddy. You can play these recordings and it's a way to effectively have me quiz you over the material for you to have an opportunity to see how well you are understanding and, and uh, retaining the contents that we're, we're going over. And then because this is a hybrid form 
form of a course, we also meet in person, usually once per week, where I do more of that, but I also am there to answer any questions that you have. I'm there to provide, again, to reinforce the clinical application of this topic. Um, and it's, uh, it's, again, just another opportunity for me to effectively quiz you to make sure that you're staying on, on uh, course, on par with, with what's the what's being expected. And then the last thing that I provide is I provide a written study guide that's fully complementary to the handout. So this is the same page from my handout on the right of the screen. And on the left is a copy of what I call the study guide. This study guide is a series of questions that allow you effectively to quiz yourself as you read these questions in the study guide over in the handout are effectively the answers. So by going through the study guide, it's potentially a way for you to review the material without actually looking at the material in the, in the main handout. And it's a way to effectively quiz yourself without having to go through the process of creating a whole bunch of flashcards or other kinds of learning devices. Now, what do students do with all these? resources? Well, most students will just follow along in the lectures and they will make any additional notes on top of the lecture packet that I provide. Some students will use these PowerPoint slides, which I provide to you as PDFs, and they will make notes along here. Uh, some students will follow along in the study guide and take their own notes. There's multiple ways to do this. And what I try to do is give you lots of options to uh, figure out what works out best for you. On the lab side of the story, this is the most exciting part of the course. I think most people are real excited about the opportunity to work with cadavers. So the way we do anatomy now is we do our labs using prosected cadavers. What prosected cadavers means is we have dissected the cadavers in advance of when you will come and see them. So you can think of prosection as being like a, a pre-dissected cadaver, or it's a professionally dissected cadaver. So I am doing a lot of the dissecting, and then I have an assistant who helps me currently do this. So these are professionally dissected cadavers. What's the advantage to this? Well, the advantage to this is because we're professionals and we're pretty experienced, we are able to complete these dissections with the structures being dissected out intact and remaining in good condition. When students dissect, and a lot of you might like to have the opportunity to dissect for yourselves, the cool thing is when you dissect for yourself, you get to be there through the whole process. You get to see it happen. You get to make it happen. But that also is a burden because it takes a lot of time for you to do that. And your ability to be successful in all times is kind of variable, right? It's real common that when students dissect things, things get broken just by the nature of the, of the process. <clears throat> so in our case, we professionally dissect four of these, and it's a very efficient way for you to see the dissected result in a good condition. We do whole body dissections. So we dissect four cadavers for each of our lab sessions. Um, in a lot of circumstances, when there's prosection labs, the, the experience will be based on parts and pieces. So you might just have a, a upper limb that's laying on a table completely separated from the body. That works, but it loses some context. We keep the dissections in the whole body context. And I think that that's really valuable for you to contextualize what you're looking at um, uh, from an entire person perspective. So this is a very time effective way to give you exposure to dissected cadavers. You get to see the three-dimensional relationships and you get to see four different donors. So you get some exposure to variation, which is really important because you don't want to just fixate on how something looks in a single individual or in a single image, because that's not the reality. We are all variations on the theme and anatomical variation is, is something you want exposure to. So what do we do to support the lab side of this process. Well, we've got a very detailed dissection guide. These are dissection guides that I've developed over the years that 
describe the process of dissection. This is again from the beginning of our first course, and it's taking you through the steps of finding and cleaning and reflecting trapezius, and then working through latissimus dorsi, and then underneath trapezius, you find rhomboid muscles. It, it talks you through the steps that are necessary in order to to work your way through a dissection. And along the way, there are the structures that you're specifically looking for. Now, I provide a number of PowerPoint presentations that will have images of all of these structures that are labeled to help you get visual context for what it is that you're trying to learn. But the most, I think the thing I'm most proud about are some recordings that I did. So what we did when we moved uh, remotely in response to COVID a couple of years ago is I decided the way that I would uh, facilitate a remote experience is I actually recorded myself in real time doing the dissection. And so I have got a library of recordings that go step by step through the dissection guide and it allows you to see the entire process from beginning to end. Um, these six images are images taken from really probably the first recording in the first course. What I do is I have the camera positioned right in front of me so that you always have my point of view and you can see my hands in the image as I'm dissecting. It's as if you are kind of remotely operating my hands as you're working through the, the dissection. And the entire time I'm narrating what I'm doing, I'm, I'm virtually quizzing along the way, you get to see all of the steps. When we transitioned from having students do dissection to this approach, there were some students that lamented the loss of their ability to do the dissection for themselves, but they actually acknowledged that by watching these recordings, it's as if they have me be part of their dissection group for the entire time. They get to watch a dissection get done well and get done completely every time. They get to experience the entire process of dissection and they get to hear the narration that I provide as I'm going through it. So the way that I do things going forward is you watch these recordings and these recordings, since I did the dissecting, it takes less time for me to get through the dissection than it would have taken for you to do your own dissection. You watch these recordings so you see the process of how dissection occurs. And then you come to the lab and you see four more donors that are done being dissected. And you get to rotate through those four donors to see four different examples of this. So where do we do the labs? Well, you're probably aware that a couple of years ago, University of Western States relocated to a new campus. It's a beautiful building in East Portland, but that building does not have an anatomy lab facility located in it. Just before we moved, well, frankly, about 10 or 12 years ago before we moved, we had just built a brand new facility on our old campus to support uh, the lab experience. And so that our old campus is now owned by a university called Linfield University. Linfield University has this campus in Portland. This is a map of the Linfield campus. What I'm saying is this map is the map of the previous University of Western States campus. And right here in this corner, building number 10 is the anatomical sciences building that Western States built on our old campus before we moved away. When we moved away and we realized that we were not gonna put a new anatomy facility in the new campus, what we did was we worked with Linfield to lease access to our old anatomy building. And it's not an old building, it's a new building, but I'm talking about the building on our, on our previous campus. This is another image of it. The first slide that I started with had an image of it. It's a beautiful building. It's purpose built to support anatomy instruction, but it's not on our main campus. So this is a, just a Google Maps to give you some context. And for most of you probably can't relate very well to this, but um, 
where we are is we're on the eastern edge of the Portland metropolitan area. The downtown Portland region would be to the left of what you see here. Out in the eastern edge of the Portland metropolitan area, there's kind of a big inter interchange where I-84, which is an east-west interstate highway, uh, inter intersects with uh, 205, which is a north-south uh, bypass highway. Our new campus, the one that we've been in for the last couple of years, is at about 82nd Street, which on the map is right here. Our old campus, where the anatomy building is, is on about 132nd Avenue. So we're about 50 blocks away from each other. That's about three and a half miles. It's about a 10 minute drive from the new campus to the anatomy building or vice versa. So it's actually a fairly convenient location. These two locations are not very far from each other. Um, I, where I am right now is I'm in my office at the Anatomical Sciences Building. That's where I do my work because I work here and I work out of the lab. This lab facility is a state-of-the-art facility. I'm really excited about the fact that we get to continue working in it. These are a couple of images from the the lab. So when you first walk into the lab, this is a perspective that you have. Uh, it's set up for 10 dissection stations around the room. There are five on the left side of the room, five on the right side of the room. There are exam lights above each of the stations to help facilitate seeing the structures. There's lots of counter space to work around. There's uh, the um, there's great uh, audio visual um, resources in these rooms. There are TVs all the way around the rooms. You see the four on the left here. TVs that I can use to project images of cadavers out to everybody in the room. Um, right in front of this computer station, or let me do it differently. If you were standing out here in the room looking back toward where I'm standing in this image, this is the view you'd have. So this is an instructor area in the lab. And there's a spot right here that is a demonstration spot. It's a little hard to tell, but right on this arm, there's a video camera right there. That's a video camera that I used when I was doing all the, all the dissecting. So I created those dissection recordings from this camera. Um, this is also the spot where I can project in high definition any of the images from the cadaver that I place under here and project it out into the room so that you as students can see what I'm looking at as I'm teaching from that spot. So the way that we do the labs is you first review the dissection videos that I created. So you see the process of doing the dissection for each week. You hear my narration. I've quizzed you along the way. Then you'll come to the anatomical sciences building and I will have four donors uh, somewhere around the room that will be dissected in the same way that you saw in those dissection videos. And the idea is, you will rotate as groups of students. You'll spend a certain amount of time at one cadaver, then you'll rotate to the next one, then you'll rotate to the third one and to the fourth one. Uh, sometimes there will be a fifth station with models or bones or whatever it might be that would be pertinent to, to what you would wanna be learning that week. All the while, I work the room, help you answer questions, help you find structures that you're looking for that week. And then the way that we end the lab session is I use the audiovisual equipment in the room, and I'll bring one of those four prosected cadavers up to the presentation station, and we do a group review at that time. And so I will go through, I'll, I'll project the, the prosection onto the TVs around the room, and I'll just quiz you as a group on the structures that you will have been looking at through the day. Students find those to be invaluable because they would have spent maybe about an hour and 10 minutes working through all the structures on those four cadavers. And then before you leave, I give you a little informal, casual kind of quiz to see whether or not you're able to still identify all that. Um, and I think the students really find that process to be super beneficial. So. That's how we do lab instruction uh, and lecture instruction in the gross anatomy courses. That's how we'll continue doing it in the morphology courses. I'm going to stop at this point and um, open it up for any questions that you might have. So I uh, 
really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to attend this session. And I certainly look forward to working with you in the future. And um, if you have any questions for us, I'm, I'm all, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borman. That was, that was great. I, I learned a ton myself. Um, we do have a couple questions here that uh, have come through. Uh, let's see, the first question um, is, what advice uh, would you have for students who are nervous or uneasy about working with cadavers? Uh, that's a very, uh, very important thing to, to discuss. So it's a, it's a, it's a very common experience to have some apprehension about working with donors. Um, many people haven't had any exposure uh, being around somebody who has passed on and let alone being around somebody who has been dissected, which is a very invasive kind of process. One thing I would say is first and foremost, realize that the donors that we work with, they and their families have all chosen to be in this circumstance. And so uh, in order to be a donor, to a program like what we do or any health professions program, the donor themselves would have expressed an interest in wanting to donate themselves to this process. Their family or the next of kin would have had to agree to make this donation afterward. And so um, the donors wanted to be part of this process. Um, the reality is when students come to the lab, there are some students that very early on have some apprehension, but what happens is almost immediately when you get into the experience of starting to look at the anatomy, um, it becomes very much an educational kind of experience. It's not that we lose sight of the fact that we're working on people, but you get very focused on trying to figure out where is this muscle I'm trying to find? Where is this nerve that I'm looking for? How does it relate to the bones that it connects to? And um, the, the donors end up becoming, I don't wanna sound callous in this way, but they become, they end up becoming the, the props, the learning structures that, that we use. So during the, the experience of the courses, um, I think that uneasiness dissipates pretty quickly because it becomes very much a focus on the educational experience. But what we do at the end of the third course is we wrap up the experience by doing something we call the circle of appreciation. And that's something that I lead at the end. And it's a, it's a time where we intentionally bring the focus back to the fact that these folks have made their donation for us. They've allowed us to use them in this very very invasive, very personal way to learn the anatomy, but it's a way that we can circle back and, um, and uh, remember with appreciation the gift that they've given us. So that's where I would go with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, another one here. <clears throat> when studying uh, for, for or completing exams, are there lab exams using the cadavers? And then a second part, is there uh, a practical component to any anatomy exams? So the way that we do exams now with the prosection-based labs is the, the logistics of how these labs run really don't allow very well for an in-person practical exam like some of you are probably familiar with. The conventional way to do lab practical exams in an anatomy course series is to use the donors to uh, put tags on different structures on the donors and have the students walk around the room to identify the structures that are tagged on, on the donors. The reality is because we're we're using just four donors in the lab. And we have, in, in some instances, we have class sizes, like in our fall class, there'll be more than 100 students. Um, the logistics of doing that kind of exam don't really work out. So the alternative that I've settled on is we do a version of a practical exam, but we do it based with images. And so from the dissection recordings, I can pull still images from the, the recordings where I did the process of dissecting, from the Q&A review that I do on a weekly basis at the end of each lab, I can pull images from the prosected recordings. And so what 
the tests are for the lab portion of the course is there strictly identification, but you have to be able to look at an image from those resources that you will have, you know, 24 seven access to, and you have to be able to, to identify the structure that I'm that I'm pointing to in the image. So it's not quite the same as standing at the cadaver and looking at the cadaver in person, but the images are all chosen with the appropriate context so that when you know the anatomy, the, the structure is, is self-evident. So the, the short answer is that the tests are image-based tests. Thank you. Uh, here's another. Um, is there any prep I can do this summer to prepare and help me succeed in the anatomy course? And then uh, what should I review or focus on studying before arriving in the fall? So I respect that. Um, it's a bit difficult to say something specific. I think, I think that would vary to some degree depending on one's experience. So some of our students begin the program with a fairly respectable background in biological sciences. So if, if one has taken a course in anatomy and physiology, one could go back and you know, look over those course materials and see, you know, just kind of refresh one's uh, recollection of it. Um, if, if one doesn't have much experience with anatomical sciences, um, I caution, I, I wouldn't want to presume that somebody would have to spend a tremendous amount of time in advance. I will say that the way that I teach these classes is I try to teach them so that people with any kind of background can, can be successful. So I try to, to start at a point where we start at an even playing field and build from there. Um, I use a, a textbook that's called uh, Clinically Oriented Anatomy. It's a, it's a classic textbook that's used in, in uh, professional level anatomy courses in multiple healthcare professions. It's Clinically Oriented Anatomy by, by Keith Moore and others. Um, but I would caution one, if, if you're the kind of person who is inclined to maybe consider getting that textbook, I wouldn't want you to get it and then be overwhelmed by the amount of content that's there because there is a tremendous amount of content in there, more so even than what I'm ultimately going to expect you to know. Um, so uh, it, I, I'm a little apprehensive about saying something like, well, you could review the textbook because that's, you're probably going to get overwhelmed by it. Um, and uh, I think if you've taken some anatomy and physiology, maybe going back and looking at the anatomy portion of it. Um, but I think you can trust that we are also designed to take people from a variety of backgrounds and, and allow everybody to be supported as they move through. These resources that I went through quickly, when you spend a little time with them, uh, I think everybody finds a, a, a system in working with these resources that they find effective to, to support their, their uh, progression through the course series. Great, great. Um, and then it looks like we have one final question. Uh, just let folks know if you have something you want to know. Now's a good time to uh, key in that question. Um, the last question we have is, how much time would you expect a student to devote to your class per quarter? Well, so the gross anatomy courses are the most time intensive courses for sure in the first term and possibly throughout each of the first three quarters. So the, the way time is kind of guesstimated is for each, each uh, lecture credit, um, the expectation is you're spending about three times, you know, three hours outside of class or three hours total for each, each credit of time um, allocated to that course. So for example, the new human morphology course is going to have the equivalent of five hours of lecture and the equivalent of three hours of lab. So what that means is that means the guesstimate is that you're spending about 15 hours of time per week working through the lecture material. And for lab, the expectation is that you're spending about six to nine hours per week. That means that that course alone is upwards of about 20 hours of time total for your weekly expectation. 
that's a lot. The, the reality is there's a lot of content. It's a big class. It's a complicated body, right? And so will everybody spend that amount of time? No, some will spend less, some will possibly spend more. It will vary sometimes depending on the particular region of the body that we're working through. Um, some people have more of a natural affinity for certain content, like maybe they're, they have some experience with musculoskeletal stuff, but they're, they have difficulty with um, uh, you know, vascular supply or what, what have you. So, and then, and then uh, making the transition from your undergraduate experience into this program, everybody makes that transition at, at a different pace as well. The kinds of things that, that one does as a student in a typical undergraduate program may or may not translate perfectly well into this program. The kinds of resources that I quickly showed you that are available here are possibly maybe likely different than some of the resources that you've had available to you in the past. And so the time that you spend is going to be based in part on how you choose to work with the, the resources and which of the resources do you find to be most helpful. But the official answer is, short answer is, for a class like this, you could be spending up to 20 hours a week just on, on this class. All right. Thank you. It uh, looks like we had one other come in. Um, do you promote partner or group studies? Absolutely. I think that uh, I think that definitely two heads are better than one, three heads are better than two. I think it's a natural thing for students who start into this program because this is what I would describe as a lockstep program where the students come in as a, as a big cohort of students and all students are taking the same batch of classes term by term by term. It's natural that uh, you develop friendships with people in the class. And when you find people that you're compatible with, to be able to work together with somebody, not just in, in a class like anatomy, but across the board in chemistry and in the technique classes and, and across the entire spectrum of the curriculum, working, having a buddy that you can work things through together helps tremendously. And it doesn't necessarily need, need to be the same buddy in every class. You might have somebody that you really connect with as you're working through anatomy. It might be somebody else that you find really to be helpful working through in, in chemistry. And that's, that's perfect. I think small groups are better than big groups. I think working with one or two other people is better than working with five or six people. Because if you're working with just one or two other people, it's more interactive. You, you can't be off on the sidelines. If you're in a group that's got four or five or six people, sometimes you can find yourself doing more listening and fooling yourself into thinking you know something when you're not really engaging with your study buddy. And, and circling back to a study buddy in, in the anatomy classes, using these resources, can there's ways to use them for group study that really facilitates the effectiveness of that. For example, one person could be working with the study guide and quizzing the other person, and both could have the handouts available as a way to kind of check to make sure you're both on track. Um, another thing that doesn't relate to a study buddy or a partner, but using drawing. I'm big on using drawing as a learning tool. So being able to just sort of diagram out different anatomical structures and anatomical relationships can be a tremendously beneficial thing to do. Um, usually in the first term, frankly, always in the first term, I also have a, I do a little session once we get into like the beginning of the second week where I, I do a thing where we talk about how you're gonna study your way through gross anatomy. And I try to provide a number of different options that people will use. So group study is one of them. Drawing is another one. Um, and we talk about some of the things that students conventionally do, things like flashcards and other things. And we talk about the pros and cons of all those things and the time that's associated with those. Fantastic. That's great advice. Well, um, looks like we're out of questions regarding uh, this particular co uh, course work. Um, any others coming in? All right. Well, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Borman. It was very informative. Um, for those of you that uh, have lingering questions, you are 
uh, welcome to send them to your advisor and uh, maybe uh, we can send them on to Dr. Uh, Borman uh, to have those answered. As a reminder, um, all these uh, sessions, including today's session, are going to be recorded and can be available uh, if you'd like to rewatch them. So um, I'm going to finish with a slide of your advisors for the doctor of chiropractic program uh, with their contact information. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you for your time today. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you here on campus. Thank you.